Baalbek is an ancient Phoenician city located north of Beirut, making it a perfect day trip from Lebanon's capital. Habitation of the site dates back to as early as 9000 BCE, and it became an important pilgrimage site for the Phoenicians to worship the sky god Baal, the queen of heaven Astarte, and their son, Adan. This is called the Heliopolitan Triad, which in early modern scholarship was thought to equate to the Roman gods of Jupiter, Mercury, and Venus. And funny enough, on the site of Baalbek, we have temples to Jupiter, Venus, and Mercury. So pretty much it was a site for worshipping the Sailor Scouts. Sailor Jupiter, obviously my favorite. Let me know yours in the comments down below. Speaking of favorite Sailor Scouts, I think Jupiter was also favored at Baalbek because the fun fact is the Roman temple to Jupiter Baal, which is one of those fun things that the Romans did with their god mishmashes in all of the Roman colonies and provinces, is the biggest temple dedicated to Jupiter in the entire Roman Empire and has massive columns that are almost 20 meters high. Alexander the Great conquered Baalbek in 332 BCE and renamed it Heliopolis, or City of the Sun. It was then annexed by the Romans in 64 BCE and made an official Roman colony in 15 BCE. This is when all of these crazy building projects began, including the Temple of Jupiter that we talked about earlier and this fantastic temple dedicated to the Roman god Bacchus. These temples are huge and absolutely stunning. I mean, Look at this architecture. Look at this lion. This lion is super cool. Of course, I can't make a video about Baalbek without addressing the elephant in the room, the archeologist's worst nightmare, ancient aliens. The foundation walls of the Temple of Jupiter contain 24 huge monoliths weighing about 300 tons each at the lowest level. The tallest retaining wall on the west also has these three humongous monoliths known as the famed three stones or the trilithon and these weigh approximately eight to 900 tons each. There's a fourth larger stone called the Stone of the Pregnant Woman found unused in the nearby quarry weighing around 1,000 tons and a fifth stone in the same quarry coming in at approximately 1,200 tons. How they move the stones? We have no idea, but I can guarantee you that it was not aliens and that the Romans 100, 1000% had the technology to put the trilithon in place. As with every archeological site, there are still tons of unanswered questions at Baalbek, but that doesn't stop us from marveling at these temples and their remarkable preservation. While most people only really go to Angkor Wat when they're visiting Cambodia, Koh Kher is a lesser known but equally stunning ancient city of the Khmer Empire. Located in a remote area about 120 kilometers away from the capital city of Siem Reap, a trip to Koh Kher may not be the easiest trek, but visitors are still able to go and marvel at about two dozen of the over 160 structures that cover the site. I wouldn't really suggest going off to find the rest of them though, because most of them are still hidden like deep within the forest and the entire area has yet to be demined. So tread lightly, my friends. Koker is a temple complex slash ancient city that was founded in the 10th century CE and was briefly the capital city of the Khmer Empire under King Jayavarman IV and his son from the years 928 CE to 944 CE. The site is home to at least 76 temples as well as civil structures, ponds, dikes, and roads. Jayavarman IV implemented a very impressive building program, which is how a lot of these structures originated. From inscriptions found at the site, it's estimated that more than 10,000 people lived at Koker while it was the capital, and a unique sculptural style emerged at the site with the creation of these beautiful, expressive stone pieces. The site was really heavily looted during the Cambodian War from the 1970s to the 1990s, and a lot of these statues now stand in museums all around the world and in private collections. A lot of statues have since been removed from Koh Kher as well for just their own protection. A lot of them are still in Cambodia, thankfully, and a few are actually trying to get repatriated as well. Koh Kher was pretty abandoned shortly after the deaths of Jayavarm IV and his son in 944, but a few more temples were built periodically over the coming years, with the last sanctuary constructed in the 13th century. The temples were then consumed by the jungle, but recent research shows just how unique this site was in its technologies, 
urban planning, and water management techniques. Did I mention that it also has this super beautiful seven-tier pyramid? Honestly, guys, do not sleep on Koker. After you visit this site, you're going to be saying, like, Angkor what? <laughs> I'm sorry, guys, that was a really bad joke. <laughs> Chidad Perdida, which translates to Lost City in Spanish, is an archaeological site that was discovered in 1972 by a group of local looters called Los Sepulvedas when they found a stone staircase leading up to the site. After years of looting by this group and countless artifacts making their way onto the black market, archaeologists were finally able to enter the site in 1976 and then they began reconstruction. Like, it being a legitimate lost city and everything is already really, really cool, but what's even cooler is that it is dated possibly to around 650 years before Machu Picchu, around the year 800 CE. Um, uh, excuse me, that's... that's pretty cool! The city is also believed to have housed anywhere between 2,000 to 8,000 people and had a complex network of stone bridges and drainage systems, which I presume are pretty darn important, especially if you're on the side of like a mountain about an entire mile above sea level. La Ciudad Perdida may have been the seat of power of the Tirona civilization, which spanned throughout the Sierra Nevada mountains, with it likely being abandoned after the arrival of the Spanish conquistadors in the 16th century. Now, I do want to mention that, despite its cool name, the city was never truly lost. There are still descendants of the Tirona people that inhabit the area. When the site was discovered in the 1970s, the indigenous leaders actually came forward and said like, hey, we knew about it all along and we've been visiting it, but we've been keeping it secret in order to keep it safe. Keep it secret. Keep it safe. Gandalf would have been so proud. Kind of makes you think, doesn't it? Scarabray is a Neolithic settlement located on the Bay of Scale on the west coast of mainland the largest island in the Orkney archipelago. The settlement contains a cluster of houses made out of flagstones that are placed in these sort of earthen dams to help support the walls. There was even a sewer system with toilets and drains that were in each house that would just carry your waste out into the ocean. If you guys have seen my Harappan or my toilet paper video, y'all know that I am a sucker for a good ancient toilet, so this site is already on my like visit next list. It's it's way up there. The site was occupied from approximately 3180 BCE to around 2200 BCE. And to be honest, these houses just look downright cozy. They had hearths and stone furniture like beds, cupboards, dressers, and storage boxes. It kind of sounds like these houses are much better furnished than my current living situation here in my rented flat in London. Just goes to show. Furthermore, all of the houses were linked by these little paved alleys. I mean, this is just so cute. Scarabray was discovered in the winter of 1850 after a storm ripped through Scotland and blew away part of the sand dune that was covering the site. Excavations began in the 1860s and the site was given world heritage status in 1999 and is Europe's most complete Neolithic village. Hierakonpolis, or City of the Hawk, is a pre-dynastic site and has been vital to our understanding of early ancient Egyptian civilization. It was the religious and political capital of Upper Egypt during the pre-dynastic period and possibly also into the early dynastic period. Hierakonpolis was the religious center of the Hawk deity Horus of Nekem, and it's also where the very famous Narmer palette was found that depicts the king wearing both the crowns of Upper and Lower Egypt. Another deposit found at the temple also contained the scorpion mace head, which depicts the scorpion king. And this object is important mostly because it was the artifact that helped me solve the mystery that were the black spots on these pre-dynastic Egyptian bulls that were the subject of my first master's dissertation. I'm kidding, it is also important in a lot of other ways, but, but that's why it's important to me. Hierakonpolis is also home to the oldest known painted tomb. The mural of Tomb 100 shows scenes of funerary bark processions, a possible goddess standing between two lionesses, and a bunch of different animals. As I mentioned before, Hierakonpolis is also home to the oldest known zoo. 
That's right, the oldest known zoological collection was discovered back in 2009. A menagerie on the site was dated to around 3500 BCE, and the 14 animals found there consisted of a leopard, two crocodiles, hippos, elephants, baboons, African wildcats, and hartebeest. It just always blows my mind that even 5,000 years ago, people were just like us, and they also had zoos. The animals that they did dig up from the cemetery on the site were found to have a lot of broken bones, so I can't really speak to how they treated the animals. But nevertheless, this site is filled with vital information for us to learn more about pre-dynastic and early dynastic ancient Egypt. I do have to admit though, like when I think about this zoo late at night, because what else am I supposed to do late at night? I get really major like Dumbo and his mom vibes, you know, when she's like rocking him goodbye to sleep and they have the sad song and it just <laughs> makes me so sad. The site of Hampi is located in southern India and was the capital of the Vijayanagara Empire in the 14th century. We have documentation from both Persian and European travelers depicting Hampi as a wealthy, thriving city with temples, farms, and markets. In fact, by 1500 CE, Hampi Vijayanagara was the world's second largest medieval city after Beijing. It was possibly also India's richest city at the time, which would explain all of the foreign travelers coming to visit. They didn't hold that title for very long though, because the Vijayanagara Empire was defeated by the Deccan Muslim Confederacy and Hampi was destroyed and pillaged and everything in 1565 CE. There are over 1600 monuments on this site, consisting of various urban, royal, and sacred structures. The monuments at Hampi are exceptional examples of Dravidian architecture, which is characterized by their larger-than-life dimensions, lofty towers over entrances, and decorated pillars. The site was also well known for chariot festivals, which were part of religious rituals. This is peak chariot for me. I mean, like, I would never want to ride around in in anything else. And I know that this is a stone one, and the real ones would have been made out of wood, but Still, the site of Hampi actually predates the Vijayanagara Empire and is mentioned in important Hindu texts like the Ramayana epic and the Puranas. Even today, Hampi continues to be an important religious center in India as the Virupashka temple is on the site and attracts humongous crowds for festivals every year. Cliff Palace was first constructed by the ancestral Puebloans around 1190 CE, primarily out of sandstone, mortar, and wooden beams. Of the almost 600 cliff dwellings that are within the boundaries of Mesa Verde National Park, the majority of them are only about one to five rooms, with many of them just being single one room sort of storage units. But that is not the case for Cliff Palace, of course, because it's called a palace. Cliff Palace has not one, not five, but 150 rooms and 23 underground religious ceremonial sacred rooms called kivas. Kivas are really important sacred places in Pueblo villages and they're really cool, so be sure to Google them. It's estimated that Cliff Palace would have had a population of around 100 people and it's thought that this particular cliff dwelling was a social and administrative site with important ceremonial usage. Cliff dwellings are very defensible positions and they were built due to increasing competition due to a rise in climate change. Cliff Palace was abandoned by 1300 CE, but was, quote, rediscovered by Richard Wetherill and Charles Mason when they were out in the park area, sort of like looking for their stray cattle. Of course, if you watch the Chidad Perdita episode in this Advent series, you'll remember that discovery isn't always what it seems, especially with sites like these and within communities that have very strong oral histories. Delos is one of the most important mythological, archaeological, and historic sites in Greece. In fact, in the 3rd century BCE, it was already considered, quote, the most sacred of all islands. The island of Delos was inhabited as early as the 3rd millennium BCE, and ancient historian Thucydides claimed that the original inhabitants were pirates from Southwest Asia. So just imagine a Mediterranean version of Pirates of the Caribbean, and that's what I kind of picture Delos as being very early on until all of the pirates were kicked out by King Minos of Crete. Between 900 BCE and 100 CE, Delos was a major cult center, worshipping Dionysus, Leto the mother of Apollo and Artemis, 
and of course, the infamous twins themselves. Delos also became the neutral meeting ground for a little something called the Delian League after the Persian Wars in 478 BCE. In 166 BCE, the Romans converted Delos into a free port, which essentially, in my mind, also just reverted it back to its fun pirate days, but probably not really. But that means a lot of rich merchants and the like settled there and built a lot of luxurious houses filled with mosaics and wall paintings. The island became a huge commercial center, which also meant that it became the largest center for slave trade in the larger region, which means that it wasn't all Great Gatsby drinks and parties, let me tell you that. And a few sites, if you go on the internet, will just claim all the, the fun, fancy, rich stuff and they won't really show you the, the realities of how people got their money. Um, so it's just important to, to keep that in mind. Think critically. But of course, all those who rise must fall. Delos's financial prosperity attracted a lot of competition, and it was attacked and looted twice in the first century BCE, after which it fell into a rapid decline and was eventually abandoned around the 8th century CE. The Plain of Jars gets its name from the over 2100 megalithic stone jars, ranging from 1 to 3 meters in height, and weighing up to 20 tons around the upland valleys and the lower foothills of the central plain of the Jiankawang Plateau. Local legends claimed the jars were drinking cups for giants, or that they were also used by a king to brew rice wine or rice beer to celebrate his victory over an enemy. Archaeological investigations have led researchers to believe that these jars were not used for alcohol production, but were in fact used for funerary practices. It's been hypothesized that the jars were used to place the dead in to expose them to the natural elements until they were skeletonized, after which they would be put into a second burial. The amount of other burials also found at this site do attest to it being a funerary area, and it also seems to have been hugely ritually significant to the civilization that used it in the Iron Age. For a while, it was impossible to accurately date when exactly these stone jars were placed in these plains for use. But recent research, and by recent I mean like published earlier this year recent, uh, states that these jars were probably placed on the site between 1240 BCE to around 600 BCE. So that means that these jars are at least 3000 years old, but other radiocarbon dates from different burials around the site show that this site was in use as late as 700 years ago. It just goes to show how ritually significant this site was to people for thousands and thousands of years. And with excavation still ongoing, who knows what other mysteries archaeologists will be able to solve about this site. Located on the east bank of the Nile in Sudan, Meroe dates back as early as 890 BCE, but it began to flourish around 750 BCE, with it becoming the capital of Kush from around 590 BCE until its collapse in the 4th century CE. If you're looking at pictures of this site and thinking that some of these structures look kind of Egyptian but not really, then you'd be correct. The Kushite king Kashta and his successor P invaded Egypt during the Third Intermediate Period and established the 25th Dynasty. This began a lot of revival of Egyptian culture in religion, art, and architecture, and it's a term known as archaism, and I actually wrote a paper on it for grad school earlier this year, so if you want a whole video on 25th Dynasty archaism, just let me know in the comments below because it's really, really cool. The revival also included a new phase of pyramid building that hadn't been seen for thousands of years. There are over 200 pyramids in Meroe. Yep, 200. It's crazy. After the Nubian kings were booted out of Egypt by the Neo-Assyrians and their original capital city of Napata was raided by the Achaemenids, Meroe became the new capital of the Kushite kingdom. Meroe's separation from a lot of outside influences also allowed it to sort of create this cool, like, Egyptian Meroitic hybrid culture. Many similar gods were worshipped, such as Egyptian gods, you know, Amun and Isis, alongside indigenous ones and statues of kings were represented in Egyptian fashion, but with local elements. I am absolutely obsessed with the 25th dynasty and the Kushat kingdom and Nubian archaeology and everything, and I think it deserves a lot more attention when we think about African archaeology, so definitely look into this one more. It's really, really cool. If you want more videos on it, just let me know in the comments below. 
Hajarim is a megalithic temple complex dating to around 3600 to 3200 BCE and is one of the oldest temple complexes in the world. The name Hajarim translates to standing stones and it's believed that this site was a religious one related to fertility practices. They found these robust figurines that are similar to fertility idols. They have solar alignments as well as a megalith that has been compared or hypothesized to be pretty much an upright eggplant emoji. I've said it before, I will say it again, as a Neolithic archaeologist, the Neolithic was wild. It was wild, like no matter where you go, the Stone Age, wild place. Wish I could be there. There aren't any human burials that have been found on this site yet, but there are remains of numerous animal sacrifices as well as an altar that is shaped for said animal sacrifices to take place. There are also remains of these like screened doorways at the heart of the complex that have been suggested to have been used by oracles. The Hajarim temple complex consists of a main temple and three other megalithic structures. You may look at these remains and think that they look a little rough around the edges and that's because they are. Some of the local limestone that was used to create this complex was a little bit softer and millennia of exposure to the elements has really taken its toll and you can see quite a bit of flaking. Luckily, back in 2009, a shelter was built over the site to help protect it for future generations. The ancient city of Copan began as a small agricultural settlement around 1000 BCE. It became an important Mayan city during the classical period, which spanned from approximately 250 to 900 CE and peaked around the 9th century, when it would have been home to as many as 20,000 people. Copan was the capital city of a major classical period kingdom, and it is filled with outstanding examples of Mayan sculpture and architecture. The central district of the site consists of two pyramids, a court for playing the Mesoamerican ball game, stone temples, intricate portrait stele, and multiple plazas and staircases. You might be wondering why I'm even mentioning staircases in the first place because, you know, like, staircases, whatever, they're boring, everyone's got one, what's nothing special about those? Wrong. Look at these staircases! These are staircases on steroids. The hieroglyphic stairway that leads up to one of the temples is carved with some 1260 hieroglyphic symbols. Imagine yourself walking up a staircase like this. Imagine it. Nothing says fancy like a swanky staircase, okay? Every movie scene you've seen, there, you know, where the woman they come, or the person, they come down the staircase and it's a really big fancy staircase and they're just fantastic. That's it. That is your main character movie moment coming down this staircase or walking up this staircase. You know, the, uh, the, the victory, the rocky stairs are important. Stairs are symbolic in so many ways. I love stairs. Copan is also home to what has been called the largest archeological cross section in the world. And this may be a little bit of an overstatement, but what happened was the river kind of cut through the Eastern side of the Acropolis over, you know, a lot of years of erosion. But what this helped to do was actually create like an actual legitimate cross section of archaeology that's about 275 meters wide and almost 40 meters tall. So that means we get to see all of the building layers without actually like digging all the way through. So that's kind of cool. You get to really see the build up, the stratigraphy of this amazing site. The Cave of Altamira is a cave complex renowned for its Pareto cave art that dates back as early as 36,000 years ago. After it was discovered in 1868 by a hunter named Modus Jubilas, a nobleman named Marcelino Sanz de Sautola started excavation in 1879 with another proper archaeologist. Actually, really fun fact, it was Sanz de Sautola's eight-year-old daughter who first discovered these infamous bison paintings in this cave, so... You go girl. The cave itself was inhabited for millennia and archeological dating has shown that the paintings were probably created over a span of 20,000 years. The cave itself is 971 feet long and while humans only inhabited the entrance chamber, the paintings can be found throughout the entire length of this cave complex. The paintings range from images of hands to deer, bison, horses, and masks that were drawn strategically around the bumps in the stone walls and ceilings. That part's always the coolest for me because that means people 30,000 years ago were looking at just the irregular undulations of natural formations of rocks and 
using their imaginations and seeing all these images that they could do and they were using this to, to their advantage for proper like 3d art and to add more depth and shadow and shape to that what they were doing it's just mind-blowing i love it the realism and the creativity of these drawings is such a true testament to human creativity and prehistoric art and it just goes to show that even 30,000 years ago we as a species were just needing to express ourselves and to like leave a mark and just kind of process the world around us in a creative way and i think that is kind of beautiful Mount Nemrud is a mountain in southeastern Turkey famous for the large number of statues at its peak of what is assumed to be the mausoleum of Antiochus I, who reigned over the kingdom of Komagene in the first century BCE. Komagene or Komagene? I think it's Komagene. Komagene was one of the kingdoms founded north of Syria after the breakup of Alexander the Great's very massive empire. Antiochus ornamented his mountain summit tomb sanctuary with huge statues of deities measuring eight to nine meters high, as well as sculptures of lions and eagles. The official name for this monument is the Hierothesion and it is one of the most ambitious construction projects that happened during the Hellenistic period. This religious sanctuary was part of Antiochus I's political program to revive Persian traditions within Comagene. And in doing this, he merged and adjusted the political and religious traditions of Cappadocia, Pontus, and Armenia. So at Mount Nemrud, you can actually see the result of this Greco-Iranian hybrid pantheon that he was doing. And I think it's a really smart political move on his part. Antiochus also commissioned relief sculptures to showcase his apparent paternal Persian ancestors as well as his maternal Macedonian ancestors. Very smart move over there Mr. Man to just you know make sure you claim authority from all the things. It's really very smart, very smart. Excavations at Mount Nemrud began in 1954 and the actual tomb of Antiochus has yet to be found but it's still believed that the burial is at this site. Why all of the heads of the statues were decapitated? I don't know, they might have all just fallen off, but they do make for some pretty cool pictures. L'Anse au Meadow contains the remains of an 11th century Norse settlement and is the earliest known evidence of Europeans in North America. The site is located on the northernmost tip of Newfoundland and indigenous settlement of that area dates back to as early as 6,000 years ago. Before Norse settlement in the 11th century CE, the most prominent of the earlier occupations was the Dorset people who were there around 200 years before the Norse people came over. The site contains eight buildings and there's evidence of iron production and a carpentry workshop. The archaeological remains at Lonso Meadow also might correspond to the Vinland sagas which document Norse explorers like Leif Erikson and their voyages to seek out new territory from Iceland and Greenland. So that's really cool because it's one of those sites that's connected through, you know, oral history and written traditions and everything like that. So that's it's kind of fun when you have like matching documentation where you think maybe it's just like a fun little story. But look, there's evidence. Jiaohe was the capital of the interior Jushi Kingdom from 108 BCE to 450 CE and is located on top of a steep cliff on a leaf-shaped plateau between two rivers. With all of this international trading going on, I can only imagine how bustling this city would have been with people just going pretty much across a, the, a very, very large chunk of the world from Europe all the way to China and beyond. The name Jiaohe first appears in Han Dynasty literature in the second century, and the name loosely translates to Castle City of the Jushi Kingdom. The buildings weren't all castles, of course. Jiaohe was divided into two residential districts with structures made out of rammed earth, mud stack, and mud brick. There was also a third district reserved for Buddhist sites like temples, stupas, and caves alongside tombs and graves. At its peak, Jiaohe had a population of about 7,000 people, but it was finally abandoned when Genghis Khan came in with his Mongols and ultimately destroyed it in the 13th century CE. Work has been undertaken to preserve these ruins since 1992 because they're made of not so resilient materials. And in 2014, Jiaohe became one of the Silk Road UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Of course, there are tons of other sites along the Silk Road, so definitely look some of them up because they're so interesting and they, they span pretty much over an entire area. And so there's so much to learn and there's so much differentiation between all of them, but Today, we're just focusing on Jiaohe. 
Cuilap is a fortress built by the Chachapoyas on top of a mountain in Amazonas, Peru. The area is filled with cloud forests, and that's where the term cloud people comes from, and cloud warriors, and I think it's great, and I want to be a cloud people. Please tell me where I send in my application. Occupation of the site dates back to as early as the 5th century CE, with the majority of the structures being built between 900 and 1100 CE. That makes it hundreds of years older than Machu Picchu, and you don't even have to do the big, like, five-day trek to get to it. There's actually a cable car that was built that will take you up the mountain in 20 minutes. There are over 500 structures on the site that are all circular in shape, except for five of them. Many stones have various reliefs carved into them, and there are even water canals made out of stone that are hypothesized to have brought water from the top of the mountain in the springs all the way down into the settlement. Coilap was home to over 3,000 people, but was ultimately abandoned in 1570 once the Spanish came in and did their conquering and all that. Not so nice stuff. If you want to explore the area more, put in Machus, or the stone tombs of the cloud warriors that house the mummified remains of Chachapoyas royalty are nearby and are absolutely stunning. So next time you're thinking about a trip to Peru, yeah, sure, go see Machu Picchu. Machu Picchu is cool, but go see this site as well because it's pretty awesome and you get a really cool cable car ride. And you know, while I did do a big hike across the country doing Hadrian's Wall, which that video is coming soon, it's coming soon, sometimes you just need to like, Stop and smell the roses and just sit and enjoy the view. Skellig Michael Island is home to a monastic settlement dedicated to St. Michael. It's not known when exactly the structures on site were built, but the dedication may have occurred as early as 950 CE. I feel like Skellig Michael would be the perfect location for a monastery version of Saturday Night Live's Stefan. <laughs> I can't with Stefan, he's my favorite. If you're looking for a monastery that has it all, look no further than Skellig Michael. Isolation, difficulty getting to the site, and only three points of entry with dramatic staircases that are gonna make your glutes scream in the morning. Dry stone masonry and dramatic views that'll help you think all of the big thoughts. UNESCO has actually called Skellig Michael a unique example of the extremes of Christian monasticism. Lord Dunraven, the very first person to make a comprehensive archaeological survey of the site, described the monastery as one so solemn and sad that none should enter here but the pilgrim and the penitent. The sense of solitude, the vast haven above, and the sublime monotonous motion of the sea beneath would oppress the spirit were not that spirit brought into harmony. I have so many questions for Luke Skywalker now, so it seems that I'm gonna have to make a trek there one of these days. Located at the west bank of the Kami River, the site of Kami was the capital of the Torwa dynasty, which rose to power after the Great Zimbabwe Kingdom between 1450 and 1650 CE. The site covered an area of 266 acres, which made Kami one of the largest urban African cities at the time. And archaeologically speaking, we have some really cool evidence just to how well connected this city was at the time. It's one of the few sites in Zimbabwe that weren't destroyed due to treasure hunting which means we have a lot of undisturbed stratigraphy that really help us get a better understanding of the history of the country. While digging, archaeologists have also found objects from Europe and Asia, including Rhineland stoneware, Ming porcelain, and 17th century Spanish silverware. Which is just crazy for me to think about because I don't do trading and all that kind of stuff in archaeology. I study a lot of different stuff, so it doesn't always comprehend in my head just how fast trading networks were and how crazy it was. So it's definitely, of course, something that I need to look at in the future so I can bring it to you guys. But all this evidence just shows that Kami was a very wealthy city with major connections all around the world. And it just, it needs some love. So give some Kami some love. I love it. It's a really cool site. All of these artifacts from all around the world, of course, just goes to show how important and wealthy Kami was and how much of a trading center it was throughout all of these networks for everywhere, even though it was like way, 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 way down there. People were going everywhere all the time. And it's just nice to remember that, that like we were never sedentary creatures and we always went off and interacted with each other. And it was kind of cool. 
Susa was a major city in the Elamite, Achaemenid Persian, and Parthian empires. Excavations have uncovered remains of continual habitation from at least 4395 BCE, but there's evidence of that developing from an earlier community dating back to around 7000 BCE. Susa was the political center of Elam during the 4th millennium BCE, but it seems like they didn't really play so well with others. Around 1764 BCE, King Hammurabi of Babylon sacked Susa and carried away all of the deities because apparently the Elamites say they weren't playing nice in the sandbox. Later, the Assyrian king Ashurbanipal destroyed Susa between 645 and 640 BCE as revenge, apparently, for some very not so nice wrongdoings that the Elamites caused towards the Mesopotamians. Of course, the history of Susa does not and there because, as I said earlier, it's still inhabited. The city was eventually rebuilt and became the capital of the Persian Empire and then later was a part of the Seleucid Empire. Susa was then known as Seleucia on the Euleus and remained an important center until it was attacked by Muslim armies in 638 CE. And then it was destroyed again. It was rebuilt again though because nothing's gonna keep Susa down and remained like that until the Mongols came in and just to completely destroyed it in 1218 CE. I feel like Susa is the city embodiment of the Black Knight from Monty Python and the Holy Grail, where like, you cut it down and it's like, there's just a flesh wound. You've got no arms left. Yes, I have. Look, just a flesh wound. And it just keeps going and it has this power and this vigor and this lust for just continuing. And I love that. And of course, unlike the Black Knight, they did prove themselves right every time by rebuilding and being successful. Once upon a time, Jerash was one of the wealthiest and most cosmopolitan cities in the ancient Near East. Settlement in the area dates back to the Neolithic, and there was an official Hellenistic city founded there in the 3rd century BCE. After Roman conquest in 63 BCE, Jerash became part of the Roman province of Syria and later part of the Decapolis, which were a group of 10 cities that were, you know, they had Roman jurisdiction, but they were pretty autonomous with everything else. Jerash saw its heyday in the second century CE, thanks to Emperor Trajan and its primary trading location. Most of the structures you see on this site today date from this period, including the Arch of Hadrian. Jerash was inhabited for many hundreds of years and it seemed to flourish no matter who was in charge. But all good things must come to an end, and in 749 CE, Jerash was struck by an earthquake and pretty much just left in ruins. After that, only small settlements ever existed on the site until it was completely like ruined and abandoned, but there is a modern city surrounding the ancient site today, proving just how enduring a place can be. Ratuboko Palace is a settlement in Java whose original name is still unknown. However, the locals attribute the site to King Boko, the legendary ruler mentioned in Roro Jongrang folklore. In contrast to all of the amazing archaeological temple sites that you get to go and visit when you go to Indonesia, Ratuboko is either an occupation or a settlement site, but its function is still unknown. It's believed that the site may have been a palace complex, which belonged to the kings of Selendra or to the Mataram kingdom. This argument is based on the fact that it is definitely not a temple and that there are remnants of fortified walls and a dry moat but then others have also suggested it to be possibly a monastery or even a pleasure or leisure center because it has baths. But there's also what might be a crematorium on site and maybe it's just me, but if there's a crematorium on site, it doesn't really scream, you know, pleasure center or relaxation spa, whatever, you know? Um, but you know, that's just me. If that's not you, you do you, as long as you're having fun and not hurting anyone. like. I don't care. Anyways, what are you waiting for? Someone has to get over there to Ratuboko and just, just figure out what it is once and for all, please, because I really want to know. I really want to know. The Valley of the Temples is located in Agrigento on the island of Sicily and is home to some of the most outstanding examples of Magna Graecia art and architecture, meaning they're some of the best preserved Greek ruins in the world outside of Greece. The majority of the monuments at the Valley of the Temples were first constructed in the 5th century BCE and includes the remains of seven temples in the Doric style of architecture, as well as an Olympion field, catacombs, and a necropolis. The funny thing about the Valley of the Temples is that it's not in the valley, it's actually on a ridge. But hey, the Valley of the Temples sounds pretty cool and very exciting, so 
I understand. The site was destroyed by the Carthaginians in the year 406 BCE, and then again by the Christians in the 6th century AD, so most of what you're seeing are the heavily reconstructed efforts of a huge reconstruction conservation project that happened back in the 1800s. The best preserved temple is the Temple of Concordia, which was saved from destruction because it was turned into an early Christian church. And if you follow any archaeology accounts on Instagram, hopefully you're following me, you will have seen this famous image of a statue of a fallen Icarus in front of this temple. This is a piece of art donated by Polish sculptor Igor Mitaraj, and it is absolutely stunning, and I cannot wait to go and visit it and take all of the selfies in front of it because it's just such a cool juxtaposition between, you know, modern and ancient, and yet, you know, it's kind of paying homage to the ancient site, and it's, ah, I love it, it's beautiful, I want to go see it in person. Really quickly, I do want to make sure that I get a warning to everyone that I will be talking about human remains in this video, and I may show a picture or two, so just so everyone is aware. Jericho, also known as Tel Es Sultan, is a tell that was inhabited from the 10th millennium BCE and has been called the oldest town in the world, as it's one of the earliest continuous settlements with over 20 of them happening successively on this site. Jericho and the whole expanse of Southwest Asia around the Mediterranean is oh, like right here. Look, a map. I sleep with this weird skull board. I don't know what that says, but there it is. It is very important for our understanding of early development of domestic societies and when everyone was becoming a lot more settled and living in more permanent situations and not doing all of the moving around hunter-gather lifestyle anymore. In fact, the pre-pottery Neolithic A phase of the site saw the emergence of one of the very first proto-cities. This is where we get mud brick houses without any real city planning, a stone wall surrounding the town, and a big stone tower that was the tallest structure in the world until the Pyramid of Djoser came around thousands of years later. Then we get to the PPNB, which is my area of study and the reason why I almost lost my sanity this summer. This is when we get different sorts of houses uh, that were more rectangular, and we get the plastered skulls, which caused a frenzy in the archaeological community when they were first found. Jericho was the site where they were first discovered in the 1950s, and they're absolutely stunning, and we're still not 100% sure as to why they were used, what their exact purpose was, how they were used. There's a lot of theories, but uh, I think I have some different ideas, and uh, it's very exciting. <laughs> Clearly, I could go on forever about the site, but I don't have time to. Settlements continued into the Bronze Age from 4500 BCE to 2600 BCE when it was at its largest. In the Iron Age, it was rebuilt in the 10th to 9th centuries BCE, but was destroyed by the Babylonians in the conquest of Judah in the 6th century BCE and was pretty much abandoned very shortly after that. That is it for the archaeological site advent. It has been 24 videos, 24 sites, 24 countries, 24 sweaters, and 24 days, and I don't know about you, but I hope you really liked it. I had a lot of fun making these for you guys. I loved all of your comments. Thank you so much for all of the support and the enthusiasm that you had throughout it. It was really warmed my heart and it kept me going really on the days when I didn't think it was going to happen. You guys made it happen. So thank you very, very much. I wish you all a very merry, happy, whatever you celebrate at this time of the year. If you liked that video, please go ahead and smash that like button down below. Do not forget to subscribe to the channel because I put out a lot more than short videos on Christmas. So make sure you don't miss out on anything there. Big thank you to all of my patrons over on Patreon. If you like the channel, you like what I do, you want to help support it so I can keep doing these videos for you guys, maybe even more on a full-time basis, head on over to Patreon and become a patron. Here are all of my socials, and as always, stay dirty, my friends! <laughs>